we always have the infrastructure in place to respond to those 500 people. That doesn't make much sense, right? <laughs> you related to Kubernetes across 100 days and me sharing with you here right on my YouTube channel for you to follow along. Now, today I'm going to be looking at serverless. You might be thinking, just another buzzword on ease. Why are we looking at that? Isn't this a Kubernetes based YouTube channel? Shouldn't you be focused on Kubernetes? Well, yes and no at the same time. There are some really cool tools that I want to introduce you to that are basically providing us with serverless functionality on top of Kubernetes. However, to really explain and show the value and why I'm so excited about these tools, I have to provide a baseline, a common understanding of when would we want to use serverless functionality, how does it work, why would we want to use it, and so on, as well as the drawbacks of those that you should keep in mind. So let's get started on the drawing board. So here's ultimately what we want to do. We have, let's say, this graph. Okay. And then we start here. We start from servers from machines yeah and we want to move up all the way to maybe containers and this is a ship and there are several containers on top now in between we have virtual machines this is a computer this is another computer they have all access to different virtual machines let's say that are running on those servers and now we want to have containers instead and ideally, we don't want to manage any of this infrastructure. We don't want to manage that, right? So the goal is that when we're moving towards the direction of containers up here, we want to spend less time managing our infrastructure, less time dealing with our infrastructure needs. Now, the thing here is that once we introduce Kubernetes, once we introduce amazing cloud native tools, main criticism here is that the infrastructure management, the resource management that comes with it is, is again increasing and we don't want that. We ultimately want to reduce the time instead of spending more time now managing instead of managing the infrastructure, the service themselves, we are now managing <laughs> Kubernetes resources, which is suboptimal. So where does serverless come in? Well, tools such as Knative can be deployed on top of uh, Kubernetes to help us provision the resources that our that our application needs automatically, depending on the, the load that is required, depending on the number of requests that we get to those applications. So let's say we have a website and we have that website is deployed as a container. I hope I can make this all visible. It's deployed as a container. This is a container again on top of our ship. And with maybe here is the sail, it's the container we have. Beautiful, right? So um, we have this container here running on top of our, maybe our Google Cloud cluster. Google Cloud, G I, I always forgot the abbreviation. Okay, this is Google, okay? <laughs> so we have it running on top of here and that has like a service that has everything that we need to basically access our application, access this application. So our client can ultimately access this application and then it's provided through uh, our cluster, through the application running our cluster. Now, the thing is, when we set up a new cluster, we have to define the number of resources that a cluster has or needs. And we have to define, um, well, if it can scale automatically the resources or not. Now, the thing here is that if we allow to scale automatically the resources and we have, let's say we have a standard number of users, we have like always three users who want to access our website, okay? Then we can say, okay, we can, we just need one or two instances of our application running. That should be fine. It should work out, right? If not more people want to access it, it's fine. But then all of a sudden we have times we have maybe 500 users all of a sudden using our application. Our service spikes up. Everybody all of a sudden wants to use our platform. And if there's so many people who want to access that application, we only have, let's say one container running or two containers running it's going to go down. We're not going to provide the service to all of those 500 people that want to access that service, right? We're not going to be able to provision that service. So what a tool such as Knative does is going to say, okay, there are more requests than more people who need to access the application. Let's scale the number of pods. Let's run more containers times maybe a hundred 
to ac to basically allow all of those 500 people to access our application. And that's amazing. So what is serverless ultimately? What does that mean? So when we think about serverless, it's not that there is no server, there's still servers running in the background. We need servers where we can deploy all of our resources, where we can deploy Kubernetes and then run uh, everything that we on top of Kubernetes on. We need servers where we can deploy our nodes and so on. So there's still servers in the background somewhere. It's like similar to having something that's wireless, right? It's like similar to having a device that is wireless. You still have a wire. However, <laughs> that wire is, for example, in your phone. If you have a phone that has wireless charging, you maybe have a pad and you can place your phone on this pad thing and that pad thing is connected to to the plugin, right? So in that case, you still have, you have your phone that is on top of the pad and that pad thing is connected to the plugin, right? I hope that makes sense. So in this case, while your phone has wireless charging to that pad, there's still a wire here. And on demand, you will place the phone on top of the pad to access the charging. And that's kind of, it's similar to how serverless works, serverless functions as well as serverless infrastructure. So for as long as nobody needs the function, let's say this is a function, function, and it does something. Maybe that does some image processing or so on. For as long as nobody needs it, it doesn't require any resources. Nobody has to access it, right? It doesn't require any resources in this case. It's just like, it's just there somewhere, like a reference of sorts, a reference to that function. Now, let's say you want to access as a user, you want to access that function because you took some really pretty images over the weekend in the mountains and those are mountains here. I'm really bad at drawing, I know this is a tree. So um, you took some really pretty pictures and you want to now process those pictures in some way or the other. So you go ahead, you access the function through an API of sorts. And then the function is like, okay, in order to process those pictures, I need to spin up some resources. I need to maybe spin up some, I don't know, some pods, some within the cluster, some, some container, something, any form of resources. I haven't digged into detail at what different serverless functions with resources they require, but you need some resources in order to process those pictures ultimately, and then also access a database in some cases, right? To then store like the final result, for example, for you to be able to access it. So for the duration of those images being processed, the function, those resources will scale up. Now, once the image processing has finished, everything is up now in the database, right? Those resources can then scale down again. So it's dramatically scaling up and down. So if you think about going back to the example up here, where we say, okay, we want to have several people to access our, our application, our deployed application. Now, the thing is, if it's always the three, same three people, if it's always like a standard kind of load, we can provide always a standard infrastructure and that might even be cheaper. So if we have, if we provide, if we, I don't know, uh, pay for one Kubernetes cluster, then that's always constant. It's a constant uh, payment situation, right? We are not overpaying, over provisioning our infrastructure. However, what happens if we under provision it, if we all of a sudden have a spike, then our users can access it. If we over provision it, if we always think, okay, in some cases we might have those 500 people who access our application and we always have the infrastructure in place to respond to those 500 people, that doesn't make much sense, right? Like you would, you would have problems maintaining that infrastructure, you have problems paying for the infrastructure, it doesn't make much sense, right? So in this case, uh, serverless architecture, oops, now I draw, serverless architecture helps us to, uh, dynamically provision the resources that we actually need, right? And that's, that's amazing. Now, there are few pitfalls with you using serverless that you should be conscious about. The first one is actually that uh, what happens if you accidentally call a function recursively? Recursively? Is that how you write it? Anyway, so if you accidentally call a function recursively or if you call a function, a serverless function, some of them might actually be quite costly. That's a problem if you don't 
like if you have if you don't have proper monitoring tools in place to uh, keep track of your serverless function then you might have a really drastic spike in your costs now the second one is uh, lock-in so server lock-in now there are different one of the really popular platforms tools is lambda lambda serverless functions on aws now in that case if you're using those functions if you're using specific like from one vendor data functions you will or might have problems switching to a different vendor using the serverless function that provided by Google Cloud, right? So you should be careful about being locked in into your environment and not being able to change. We want our environment to be really portable. We want to be able to switch between the, our environments on the go depending on our needs. Our environment has to respond to us instead of us responding to our environment, right? And then the last thing is, that serverless functions, <laughs> depending on which ones you use and how you use them, they have a cold start. Cold start. Now, what does a cold start mean? What is that actually? I hope you can see this. Now, a cold start is ultimately when, <laughs> when oh, your function is called for the very first time. So we called it function for the first time let's say, to load our website over here for the first time, right? It's the first time that this website or like that our maybe the, oops, that our function to process our images is actually called. And in that case, it has to load. It has to like make the connections between different resources and so on. And that can take a bit longer than calling the function for the second, for the third time and so on. Now, if you're curious to learn more about that, I have some really helpful resources and amazing articles linked in my public Notion page, so check that out. Now, this is it for today. I hope it was useful. If it was, please do remember to hit the like button, subscribe to my channel for upcoming videos. I would highly appreciate your support. Also, I have a weekly DevOps newsletter where I share free online learning resources from across the DevOps space from amazing people such as yourself right to your inbox every Sunday. If there's anything, any content, any video, any blog post, anything you would like to highlight to the community, please do reach out. I would love to hear from you and include that in this week's newsletter or next week's newsletter or at any point in time. So link below on how you on all the information. I hope to see you in one of my next videos. Have a lovely day. Bye bye.